This is Philosophy for Knowledge, and today we're talking about Locke, Berkeley, and Thomas Reed. Let's think a little bit about where we are in this journey through modern philosophy and the epistemology of modern philosophy. So we saw Descartes brought these real problems into philosophy. He started his project with this extreme doubt. He ends up using the dream argument to doubt everything, and then he finds one certain truth, I think, therefore I am, which he decides, even if he's being deceived about everything else, he can't be deceived about his own existence. From there, he uses the idea of perfection to prove that there must be a God, because how would he have gotten the idea of perfection? Since nothing in the world that he sees is perfect, nor is he himself, Descartes concludes, God exists, put the idea of perfection into my mind. Most philosophers would agree that Descartes did a good job proving that at least our own existence is certain. But Descartes had to prove that God existed in order to get the rest of the world back for himself. So if the proof of God doesn't work, which some philosophers thought it did not, then Descartes is left in this position of knowing nothing more than, well, I know I exist, but I still don't know if the external world is there. So a lot of philosophers following Descartes wanted some other kind of a proof for how we could know that the world that we perceive really is the way it seems. We also looked at David Hume last time. David Hume was skeptical about the idea of the self, about causation, and about induction. He looked inside and he said, I have mental states. I'm aware when I look in myself of individual things I'm feeling, experiencing, perceiving. But none of these things that I perceive inside myself are consistent throughout time or always there in the way that a set concept of self would be. David Hume was also skeptical about the idea of causation. We observe some event following some other event, but how do we know that the one event, the movement of billiard ball A, actually caused the movement of billiard ball B? All I see is one event happening, a second event happening, and I don't actually see, question mark here, a mysterious connection between the two. So why do we think that there is a necessary connection? It's never observed. And because of that, Hume concluded we should be skeptical about induction. He says there's no logical or purely rational justification for believing that the future will resemble the past, except for the fact that in the past, the future resembled the past, but that's circular. We haven't really talked about Thomas Hobbes yet, uh, but Hobbes introduces another skeptical problem that philosophers will be dealing with as they try to solve all of these skeptical issues, and that is the problem of physical determinism in the world. So Newton is on the scene by this time, and it seems like Newtonian science is starting to show that things follow natural laws. Now, why is this a problem? Well, let's go back to our billiard balls here. Ball 1 hits billiard ball 2, and as a result, billiard ball 2 moves off in a certain direction with a certain speed. And Newton's laws were starting to show that these kind of interactions happen consistently without exception, and that the movement of everything that's physical can be explained with these physical laws. But then how do I think about that physical body, which is me? This body itself is made out of physical stuff. It's made out of a bunch of things put together that are not entirely unlike these billiard balls. So if I do something like raise my hand, how do I explain that behavior? Well, if I go back to Newtonian physics, I would say, well, it's just atoms and molecules in motion that cause other behaviors, and it's an entirely physical system. Human beings, the human animal as a physical system, 
is explainable and with enough predictive power, even predictable from the laws of science. So it looks like human behavior, if I say, well, I decided to raise my hand, it looks like human behavior is going to be explained by physics rather than by human will or human choice. And the idea of human freedom, the ability to do what we choose just because we choose it, looks like it's also in danger. So many philosophers, like Hobbes said, yeah, it seems to you like you decide, yes, I'm going to raise my hand. And then you do, in fact, raise your hand. But really what goes on here is just sort of a sideshow. The true explanation for what happened is not from your mind, but from what went on inside your skull itself, in your brain. Patterns of behavior and neuronal transfer sends a message which results in your hand moving. All right, now these skeptical challenges are important because the philosophers that we'll look at for the rest of the modern tradition, this is going to include Locke, as well as Reed, Berkeley, and Kant, are all trying to solve these problems. They want to get this kind of stuff back and to save it from the skeptical doubt. Many of these philosophers are also religious, so in addition to getting rid of these problems about human knowledge, are going to want to go back to the idea of God and ask if God has any explanatory role left in human knowledge and if humans can know that God exists. So all of the philosophers that we will be looking at in this section are referred to as empiricists. An empiricist is someone who believes that all knowledge and ideas come from experience. So you can see how they're influenced in some ways by the scientific tradition here, the idea that observation and explanation is really the best way to understand our world. When we start off as a baby, Locke and Berkeley are both going to say, we don't know anything yet. It's only from experience and observation that our ideas get populated in our mind from the experiences and things we perceive and observe in our world. But Locke and Berkeley both spend some time at the start of their essays trying to show that we don't have any innate ideas, that in the beginning we're babies who know nothing at all, and why would we know nothing at all if there were certain ideas that were just planted into our minds? The first philosopher that we'll talk about is John Locke. He lived 1632 through 1704, born in England. And Locke is part of this important empiricist investigation into what we can know and what we can't know and why. So let's imagine that you are in fact an empiricist and you realize there's at least two things going on in the process of getting knowledge. One of these things is that there are things in the world. This is a ball. And the other is that you are a perceiver in the world. And you are perceiving in your mind the world to be a certain way. Here's the green ball as it exists in your mind. And you're using your process of perception to get out there into the world and experience the world. Now you're a strict empiricist, so you believe that you have to get your knowledge from the world from what you actually observe. But here's an important question. When you're looking out into the world and you see something like this green ball, is everything that you see in the ball a fact about how the ball is in the world? Or is some of what you see just a fact about how perception works for us as humans and about how the world seems to us? 
So as Locke starts to answer this question, he decides that there are both primary and secondary qualities. Primary qualities for Locke are things that exist actually in the world itself. So primary qualities are things we perceive about the world, but they actually describe the world as it is. But he also thinks that there are some secondary qualities. And these secondary qualities actually just describe how the world seems to us, but they aren't in the thing itself. So let's think about this ball and the actual properties that, that it has. So this ball is green. Now, what about green? Is its greenness a property of the ball itself, or is it a property of the way that we perceive the ball? Locke is going to say that green is in fact a property of the way we see the ball. If there were no perceivers, the world wouldn't have a color in it. Color is just the way human beings, because of their perceptual mechanisms, observe what's in the world. But it's a fact about perception, not a fact about the world. Now, what about a property like shape? Is shape a property of the ball itself, or is shape just something about how the ball appears to me? If I'm sexist, remember, I'm going to say, well, who knows, something looks a certain shape to me, and it looks another shape to others, so we can't answer. Locke says, well, no, actually, we can answer. We understand the way shape works. It might look different from different angles, but we can give an overall objective description of the shape of an object. And so shape is over here in the primary qualities. It's something that's actually true of the ball itself and not just the way the ball seems to us. Okay, what about something like the smell of the ball? Locke is going to say that smell, again, belongs here. It's a property of the mind. It has a certain smell to me because of how I perceive the, uh, really, the molecules of the rubber ball as it enters my nose. But that's just something about how humans perceive rubber. Other organisms could do it differently, and things don't smell in the world. What about something? like space. This is meant to be my spatial grid showing the location of the ball here in quadrant B6. Is this a fact about the world or a fact about my perception? Locke is going to say that location is a real fact about the world, something we share among observers and exists in the world itself. And it's not a fact just about how I perceive it. What about something like taste? Well, Locke is going to say that that taste, just like the color, exists as a fact about human perception. How about something like movement? Well, we could imagine that this ball moves from its location to some new location. That's going to be for Locke just as much an objective fact about the ball as its original location in space. So movement is objective. Something like a texture, very closely related to shape, and it's a fact about the ball itself. Locke also includes, Locke includes the property of penetrability as something that's true of the object itself. Um, if I stick a pin into it, is it going to poke through the ball, or is the ball impenetrable? Well, those facts about how objects interact with each other are objective facts about the ball as it exists in the world, as opposed to something like sound, 
which is just a fact about how my human ears work. The same thing would be said about the sensation of feeling, as in what something feels like when I physically touch it, perceptual property. Does it feel soft? Well, that's a property of my perception. Is it penetrable, meaning can other things poke through it? That is a property of the ball itself. So for Locke, when it comes to knowing the nature of the external world, he's not a skeptic the way Descartes was, at least when he was lost in his skeptical doubt, or like Sextus. But he does want to say, well, certain things about the way the world seems to us are just facts about the way humans perceive the world. These are the secondary qualities. And certain things are facts about the way the world itself actually is. And these are primary qualities. Secondary qualities, another way to say it, are the way in which we perceive the primary qualities which are true of the world. Both of them are properties of perception, but primary qualities are properties of both perception and of the world as it truly is. Now this raises an interesting question for Locke, because what Locke has said is that we can know attributes or properties of certain objects, and as an empiricist he wants to say we know those properties through observation because all ideas come from observation. What are there besides properties? Two objects. So a rock is solid, this rock is white, this rock is heavy, it's a medium size. We can observe properties of objects, but is there more to objects than just the properties? You can see how an empiricist might be stuck on this question because all we can observe is attributes of the rock. But Locke also believes in substances. What are substances? Substances are just that within which all the properties in here. So there has to be something to be white, to be heavy, to be hard, and that thing is the pure substance of the rock that all these attributes inhere within. But this is a problem for an empiricist because how can you possibly observe a substance that doesn't have any attributes? If a substance is just the stuff that the attributes belong to, how can you get past the attributes that we observe, both primary and secondary qualities, and get to this invisible substance, which can't be observed. Well, Locke knows this is sort of a problem, but in the reading he says, well, these qualities must inhere in something. The qualities must belong to something. Sure, I can't say anything more about this underlying substance because you can't directly observe it, but there must be something there. You can see why other empiricists might not be happy with this idea because he's admitting that he is believing in something which is in principle not capable of observation itself. If you can't actually see it or observe it, there's no way to get an idea of it in the first place, and so what you're talking about must not actually make sense on empiricist grounds. Now Locke also believes that there is similarly a non-physical substance that makes up our soul. This is equally a problem for the empiricist because how do we perceive something like our soul? Well Locke answers and says we do directly perceive ourselves doing things like thinking, feeling, willing, etc. and these attributes are all non-material attributes and must reside in something like a non-material substance. Again I can't perceive it directly but must make sense that these attributes inhere in something. The attributes themselves are non-physical, so it makes sense to conclude that there's non-physical substance because these attributes must be attributes of something. So maybe we can keep the idea of the soul even from this scientific empiricist perspective.